The following conversations took place at the 2020 Urban Farm Academy Invitational in Dallas, Texas. Welcome back to Bootstrap Farmer Radio, guys. This is Oscar, your guest host today. Um, so, and if this is your first time, welcome to the podcast. I'm glad you found us. Uh, stick around for the ride. We got a bunch of cool interviews on this uh, this radio show. Um, I definitely recommend you take a take the moment and listen to all of them. If you're anything like me, you'll be in the garden with your earbuds on, just crank them out all like back to back. I feel like uh, binging when I'm on Netflix, when I, when I listen to the radio. So, but guys, uh, today I have an awesome guest uh, based out of Arlington, Virginia. He's doing some really awesome things with hydroponics, growing some rare specialty greens and herbs and edible flowers, definitely up my alley, super cool. I'm very uh, pleased to have him here. My guest today is Ryan Pierce and he's from uh, Fresh Impact Farm, not Family Farms. <laughs> That's an inside <laughs> joke, but but either way, maybe he'll he'll indulge us with that at some point. But um, well, thank you for being here, man. I really appreciate sure, it. Absolutely, you know, my I've, pleasure. I've oh, man, I've I've watched you basically like yeah. a stalker, <laughs> on, 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 like Instagram and and all the uh, social media platforms that you're on. And dude, you got some really polished, awesome looking systems. I mean, the the product that's coming out of there is fascinating. And uh, what's was it always like this? No, 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 no. Um, you know, this is our, we'll call it our phase 1.5. Uh, phase one was wow. a, uh, a eight foot by four foot grow tent in the guest room of my house. Um, and that was just to prove out, is this something if I could grow really high end products, could I sell them into the best chefs in the city? Um, and that, was very well received and then it was a matter of okay we're going to turn this into a business and now it actually has to scale to a commercial size that's where we are now um we are constantly tweaking making adjustments to try to make the systems run better more efficient um less components Mm -hmm. so simplifying them down while making them more productive along the way So you start to learn a lot about the different types of systems, different types of plants, what kind of system they really like, what they don't like. Um, And so we're constantly trialing out new varieties, trialing them in different systems, um, and then using different growing methods, whether we leave something in a 1020 flat we transplant it into the, the deep water systems. Are they in a three and a half inch deep system, a six inch deep system, completely recirculating um, or a flood and drain type system? So we trial a lot of different varieties and a lot of different growing methods to figure out what really works. Um, and then we take all that data and we move the farm forward uh, as a result. Right on. And so like, well, let's step back for a moment. Were you involved with hydroponics or agriculture in any way? When you first got into this? No, not at all. Um, so I was in cloud computing before I got into agriculture. Um, and that taught me the importance of not only what you can do with, with data and how valuable it can be to an organization, but also I really got a sense of how to take things that can be very complex mm. and simplify them down. Um, and so my interest in hydroponics and vertical farming came through, um, just seeing all of the issues around food and food production and access to, to high quality food. And so once my business mind kicked in, it was a matter of figuring out how do you create a successful business out of this first because you can affect change but it's very hard when you're first starting out to instantly affect change you have to build a build a business that's self-sustaining before you can really start to impact um, you know changes within your community if you're really going to build a long-term if you're on a long-term strategy. Um, and I view the impact that businesses can have is directly correlated with their ability to be financially self-sustaining in the long term. 
because if you give all of your product away or you um, you don't have the correct business fundamentals and, and financials, it's very hard for you to then turn around and impact your community in a positive way over the course of multiple years. You may be able to do it in small bits here and there, but all of a sudden if the business goes away, all, all of that good that you did was just that short period of time rather than it being a sustaining good where you're actually affecting long-term change within the within the food system. So that's the that's the path that we're on. And so that's why we chose to go after the best minds in the culinary world um, and work with them to show them that you can buy hyper local products that are the best of the best instead of having them shipped in from various parts all around the world. So when, when you first started, obviously everybody's dream is to, you know, get in the kitchens of a Michelin chef, but that doesn't happen all the time. And so like when you first started out, did you say, okay, I'm going to talk to a couple different restaurants and see if they'll trust me? Because really that's what it is, trust in the beginning, especially when you're new at this. Absolutely. Um, so wh wh what would that, what did that look like in the beginning? Like where, where are you talking to one chef? Where are you talking to two chefs? I mean, how um, so before I built a single component um in the proof of the original proof of concept i had it sat down and had a conversation with um one of the biggest restaurateurs in dc um that that i had a connection through a mutual family friend who helped set this up and my whole thing was i just wanted to ask him that if we had this product available would it be something he'd be interested in he said yes but it's really hard for him to say yes until he's actually seen or tasted the product and so it was immediately after that weekend that I started designing and gathering the components for the proof of concept environment. Um, and then it was about two, two and a half months later, I guess, um, when I had the first samples uh, for him to try. Once I took those samples into them, the reception was incredibly positive. Um, when it was essentially we'll buy everything that you can grow and at that point we were growing heads of lettuce micros and herbs we didn't have any edible flowers at that point um and then it became this scenario where suddenly the proof of concept environment wasn't big enough because we couldn't even supply one restaurant's needs out of that eight foot by four foot footprint um and so then it was a longer term process. So this was in, this was in December of 2016. And then we went through the design of the new farm, search for space, finally found a space in June of 2017, um, went out and got a small business. I already put a lot of my own money into it and was still putting a lot of my own money into it, but then went out and got a small business Start loan. <laughs> um, Cause these farms aren't cheap to build. Like you can't, while well, this is bootstrap farmer radio, a farm like ours is very hard to truly bootstrap um, unless you just have a few hundred thousand dollars sitting in the bank. Which so, most but you still don't. bootstrapped your initial, you know. Correct proof of concept absolutely you know, in a small space you know and and just did what you could realize that you had something that that was working right you just needed to step it up just a little bit more and further educate yourself so you can actually get into these restaurants yeah so um now when you when you went from that a that smaller room did you end up going into that uh what was it a thousand square feet mm -hmm. uh warehouse so what was that like i mean that must have been a little bit scary at first especially starting out in something new um, because you're going from just a handful of crops that you're working with to all of a sudden, like you're getting requests, I'm sure, from some of these chefs like, hey, can you try this? And us as eager entrepreneurs, we're like, yeah, you know, not only that, but just as farmers in general, like, right. or artisans. Because like, for instance, you know, you, you I'm an artist myself and uh, I get asked for custom work all the time. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, you don't want to let anybody down. And you're like, absolutely, I'll do it. And so you start piling on all these orders. And next thing you know, you're pulling your hair out because you're like, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to deliver? You're trying too many things at once. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we did that constantly. We, I mean, we have over 350 varieties that we've grown to date. And there, there were times in the farm where we probably had 100 different varieties growing at once. 
there's no way for you to keep track of all it. There's no way for you to actually start to understand those crops and you have that many varieties. Um, because at that point, you're just, you're stretched so thin. You're just trying to keep the plants alive, let alone helping them to thrive in that environment. So we went through that whole process and yeah, going from a small footprint to, uh, you know. Well, yeah, your, your, your conditions, your elemental conditions inside your environment's going to change. It's right. It's that's pretty daunting. And there's so much more that can go wrong (laughs) um, at at that scale. And, you know, we thought we had plenty of runway from a financial perspective. And it turns out that we did not give ourselves nearly enough runway from a financial perspective. Um, You know, we had we got a fungal infection that just decimated our entire, you know, true first batch of crops. so eventually after fighting it for, I don't know, two months, we eventually decided to wipe the whole thing out, disinfected the entire farm, wow. um, came up with a, a microbe, we'll call it a tea, if you will, um, that we bred in the farm to, to increase their population and started dosing all the systems with that. And that seemed to really help um, the situation. That's similar to like a compost tea, but yeah, it's- yeah, definitely similar. Um, but we were basically buying a, a bunch of different varieties of beneficial microbes, and then we would uh, we'd put them into aerated containers, and then feed them molasses to increase their populations before we dose them into the systems. Um, and ultimately, that that probably saved the the business as a as a whole um because if we couldn't have figured that that issue out we wouldn't have had any product to sell and how did you figure that issue out like did, did somebody help you know guide you along the way did you <laughs> talk to people did you just do research <laughs> youtube i mean what do you, obviously everybody everywhere. goes to youtube <laughs> everywhere um we talked to people um we did i mean hours tens hundreds of hours worth of research um trial and error and there's just for this kind of growing there's just not that kind of information out there available um there's a lot of things on the cannabis grower blogs that have been there for years because people have been trialing this stuff you know growing the stuff in their house for a long time and so there's actually a decent amount of of experienced growers that have gone through some of these challenges. Um, And some people post everything online and basically talk about like the challenges they've gone through. And so you get information from there. We worked with, you know, some, uh, some of the universities around us. We looked up scholarly articles. I mean, we were, we were in desperation mode at that point and we had to figure something out because we, I mean, we were losing thousands of dollars a month. Overall, the entire issue ended up costing us over sixty thousand wow. dollars. So, in terms of just operating costs, labor costs, yeah, you know, and we weren't making any money at the time. So, did you have it's a- lost revenue plus yeah, the loss and in, then- in literally true you know, liquid dollars. Well, not only that, but you're, you know, I don't know if you had the relationships already with the chefs and they're just waiting mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, yep. are these guys really going to deliver what's going on. Absolutely. So it's, it's, you were not, I mean, you started by proving the concept on a smaller scale, but I feel like the proof of concept, uh, it just keeps, it keeps, it's ongoing. The more you expand and try different things. So there's always that, that fear at first, but I think like yourself, you just have to kind of keep pushing through that and try right. to figure out solutions rather than panic. Absolutely. And and don't get me wrong, there's definitely a healthy dose of panic in there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, you used to have long hair right down your shoulders yeah. <laughs> at one point. But that was, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Um, uh, but yeah. Um, but I'm sure if my hair were to grow out now, there would be more gray in there than, than there used to be, no doubt. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's those scenarios, though, that kind of teach you what kind of, you know, internal fortitude you have for dealing with problems. And, and these things will wear on you, especially when you have everything invested into it. And that was, I knew that if I was going to do this, I have to be all in. I'm one of those people that can't be half in 20% in for Like I have to be all in. And when you're all in and you've put 
$100,000 of your own money that you had saved up into something and basically like the love of my life supported us at the time mm -hmm. and she's hell she still is today um but you don't have an alternative you basically like you're either going to figure it out or you're going to fail and tuck your tail between your legs and you know admit your failure and move on right. and if we would have failed we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation today if, if i had just given up and so i'm very proud of the fact that we at the time were able to stick through that um but the stress that level of stress didn't go away for a year and a half because actually it probably didn't go away until october of 2019 so you know four months ago no wow um uh, because the business was constantly up and down up and down up and down from a sales perspective from the amount we could produce um i'm really blessed to have a incredibly talented team um that really make me look like the smart person but at the end of the day i'm just the one steering the ship they're the ones that are actually making the ship ship go um and i don't think people give that enough credence that you gotta surround yourself with some pretty amazing people and once you find those people you got to hold on to them really tight yeah. um, because they're going to be the difference whether or not your business is successful. No business is successful based on the founder. And there's a lot of founders that want to say, well, it's because of me that we're successful. Yeah. You no, understand. you had a great idea <laughs> and you're a great executor, yeah. but you can't execute anything at scale without a great team around you. Correct. And that team has to be willing to go through those trials and tribulations that are going to cause them to lose sleep at night. But you want people that are bought in at that level that understand there's a lot riding on this. Not only do their jobs depend on it, because it's not like if it's not like we just have a ton of revenue coming in from another stream. If things fail at the farm, yeah, that's their job. Up. Everybody loses. Yeah. So that's an ongoing struggle. There's always gonna be something with with this kind of production, this high intensity thousands of crops in small spaces you're gonna run into challenges you were these systems are designed from the ground up there is no oh this system's been running in in plant factories for 20 years Nothing's it's perfect. Perfect. Nothing's perfect there is none of that yet and there won't be that for for years we're dealing to come. with nature you know we're dealing with live plants things change you know things change yeah and we'll, we'll what we will get to is a point when this industry essentially operates like a, any other manufacturing plant as long as you make sure that the systems are all calibrated in the exact perfect way, it'll run like a manufacturing plant. On manufacturing plants that have robots that literally will do a weld 100% perfect every single time, problems still arise. Yeah. Like you said, we're dealing with living, living things. So just tiny little changes can cause problems to arise. But the more we assert control over all of those elements within the grow space, um, the more you can mitigate some of those things before they even become problems. And, and but that's gonna take us, uh, we're five, 10 years at least away from having true plant factories, vertical farms that actually operate that way. The big guys, that have $100 million in the bank are still struggling with some seemingly small problems that should have been figured out. Um, leaks. Yeah. You know, we're dealing with water and lots of connection points. Leaks happen. Um, but at the same time, eventually we will get to a point where we are controlling every single little aspect of the environment and it's tailored to the the specific crop in that specific location to where we're mitigating the risk more and more. Um, and that's the biggest challenge we have in this industry is that yes, we can control the environment, but we still have a ton of risk around crop failure. And the more we can mitigate that risk and make these systems more resilient, the more financially viable these businesses will be so long as we control our capital costs, we bring down our, our percentage of labor costs, 
Um, and ultimately we start running these things, not like startups, but like actual long-term businesses where we're not just hemorrhaging money. Yeah. We're really looking at the business fundamentals and we're trying to make these things profitable earlier rather than saying, oh, we'll be profitable in 10 years. That's how you scare investors away, in my opinion. Like you need to be able to show that the fundamentals of the business can be profitable from an early on. Otherwise, you're just basically running a, a form of financial arbitrage where you're just you constantly need more money to grow and grow and grow. Don't worry, we'll eventually get profitable once we're at this massive scale. Everybody just looks at the Amazon model. Right. That's not going to work for every kind of business. And, and so and, and investors can come in many forms, not just yep. financially, but people that are around you supporting you. If if you just <laughs> If you're not focused on trying to make this viable and because we're organic, what we're growing is organic organisms and everything's evolving. So it's mm -hmm. like you have to adapt. You can't just stay headstrong on one idea if it's going to burn to the ground. Absolutely. You got to be able to adjust because people aren't going to want to put the time into helping you if if the ship is going down there. Unfortunately, some people are going to jump off that ship. The captain is, is probably going to stick with the ship, but but I think instead of sinking with the ship, let's try to move around the obstacle. Let's try to come and up with different solutions. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you hit the nail on the head is you have to have people that are willing to, to kind of tough it out with you mm -hmm. and understand that it's not going to be perfect. It's not, things are not going to go right all the time. Tell me about it. They're going to go wrong more often than they go right. And it's how you adjust once things go wrong that's going to determine the long-term viability of your business is can you, do you have the grit to be able to handle constant failure? And, and then do you have the mental fortitude to be able to work through that failure and come out in a positive way on the other side of it and say, we just learned so much from that problem. Yeah. And it absolutely. was killing us at the time, but now we know so much more because we went through that where if you didn't go through it, you don't know that much. If you, if you just got lucky and you just keep having success after success after success, you don't really know that much because you don't learn from successes. You learn from failures, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you have to go through these failures. And so all these failures, I and mean, there was a point in time where over the course of two months, I lost 15 pounds and I don't have any weight to lose. Like, you, you know, yeah, just you're looking at me, I don't have anything to lose. And so I lost, I, I lost a dangerous amount of weight. Um, because of, because of stress. Um, and like my face was gaunt mm. and it was the people that are closest to me, my family, my, my fiance, she didn't necessarily see it cause she was seeing me every day while in hindsight, she now realizes it, but it was my family and my doctor who I walked into the doctor's office and she came into, and I was just going in for a regular routine checkup and she came into the room and just took one look at me and was like, you don't look so good. Hmm. That was scary. Um, and then she looked at my weight. I was like, we had a problem. Hmm. I said, yeah, I know. I know we have a problem. Um, but at the time I didn't, I was just going day to day. Yeah. Like there's like, there's no just like grinding it out, trying to get yeah, it to work. Yeah, exactly. And I think Jeez. if there's anything that I would like people to kind of learn from that is you have to kind of keep things in perspective. I was, I was at the point then when I would do anything to keep this thing from failing. In hindsight, if it had failed, it wouldn't have been the end of my life. I'd be doing something else and, I'm the kind of person that I'm going to go into something and put everything into it um, and I'll find a way to make it successful. But if this venture failed, it wouldn't have been the end. But at the time it felt like that. Yeah, Cause you have all you feel, well, you feel like all your chips are in and yeah, exactly. your energy, everything into it. So yeah. the last thing you want to do is see something fail. But like you said, you know, these failures are important mm -hmm. because they do teach you something. And I think one thing for someone starting out, maybe, maybe you don't, take on too much than you can chew. Get this one smaller system going first, figure out what you're doing. So the stress doesn't multiply because it will. I yeah. mean, you know, but it, like you said, it, it it never ends. There's always something. Yep. And and I think it's better to remember that this, we're in this to be sustainable. Yeah. Not just as a business, but for life. You know, we can't sit there and burn ourselves to the ground. Trust me, I mean, I, I, I am not being a hypocrite whatsoever because I, I, I've gone through this, you know, and I still am, you know, yeah. uh, adjusting to a new schedule, you know, working two jobs, you know, 
working off farm and also trying to get the farm started. Sure. It's like I'm working till two in the morning at times and then grinding it out. And my wife's like, listen, you need to get some sleep. Yes. So, and, and I, you need to listen to your wife when she no, tells you yeah. to get some sleep. Absolutely. Because it is so important. People don't, they don't value it enough. And you'll burn the midnight oil until you can't anymore. Yeah. Right? Because you're, you're driven. And it's the ones that are so driven that really affect long-term change. But it's also the ones that are so driven that burn out and their quality of life is absolute garbage. It's that bright star, man. And well, and you got to find that balance, right? You have to find a way to be able to say, I got to get all this stuff done. But I also want to spend time with my son. Yes. I also want to yes. spend time with my wife and I want to still have that family connection because they start to lose that. You may think you still have it, but they're losing it because they feel like they're losing you because they're, they don't see you as much. They know you're constantly stressed. Your mind is always in one spot. And you're not we, present. You're not present. present. You got it. Yeah. And we as entrepreneurs sure. have to do a better job and, and myself included. Like I'm talking like I know what I'm talking about. But at the end of the day, I'm learning this as I go. But I'm speaking from experience. I've been through this and I realized what I did wrong and I've learned from it. And I still, I still struggle to this day with being present and like I'm planning my wedding right now oh, and my fiance, you. thank you. And my fiance will have, you know, she'll want to talk about a detail and I struggle with taking myself out of my day and being present for that conversation. Those I have ridiculous ADD. So it's like, she can be talking and I can be hearing what she's saying going in one ear coming over here is something complete, a completely different topic. And so my brain's trying to process this all at once. And while I may be hearing what she's saying, I'm not actually present for that conversation. And she's gotten to the point where she can literally see it in my eyes of whether or not I'm focused on yeah. what she's talking about, or if my, my brain is doing something different back here, which is a little creepy when I can be looking at her dead in the face and she knows I'm not listening to her. Right. But that's how you know somebody knows you, right? Yeah. yeah. But that's something that I really want to get better at. I want to get better at being present for those moments because those are the only people that matter at the end of the day. They're the only ones that are going to be there yeah. whether things go right or go wrong. Exactly. And so I want to make a better effort to show those people that I'm close with that when I'm with them, I'm with them. And I'm going to make time for them and spend those hours with them because you really need that. You need that recharge to get away and trust that everything is happening as it should. We're here in Texas, right? Yeah. My team's back in Arlington. We have one of our biggest customers visiting this, the farm this morning. I'm here wow. and I just have to trust that everything's going to go well. And I'm lucky enough to have a team that will handle it just fine and everything will go perfectly fine. I'm sure it'll go well, but that took a long time to get to that point, right? Like it's not yeah. something that you just happens overnight. You don't, you don't get trust in somebody overnight or even in a few months. It takes a long time to build up that level of trust in a team. And but when I come to these things, I want to be present. I want to be engaged. And like when we're sitting down there having those round tables, I want to be present for the person that's presenting because if I had this kind of setup when I was just starting out, the value that that would have created for me is exponential. Like it can't even, can't even tell you how valuable that would have been for me to have this kind of a group come in and, and just drill you on that stuff. And, and I hope that yes. you, you got, got some of oh, some benefit out of it. Are you kidding me? You know? This is amazing. This has <laughs> been an awesome trip. And, and like you said, you know, you, sometimes you do have to make sacrifices, but you also have to know when to give and when to take. Mm -hmm. And for me, like I don't have a team other than the best teammate, which is my wife. Yeah. And my little one, he, he likes to go behind me and undo stuff that I'm doing, but it's okay for now. It works out. Eventually you'll get him to he's start training. Seeing. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's exactly. an intern. No, <laughs> but, um, but the thing is like, you know, without a family her, farm. I couldn't it's be here. Yeah. It's a family farm, yeah. which we got to tell people what I'm yeah, talking yeah. about in a moment, but cause everybody's probably like, what does he mean? Um, but anyways, but so like, yeah, without her, I couldn't be here to do this. And like anybody can go on YouTube and do the research, mm -hmm. but, and that's, don't get me wrong. That's helped get me 
to this point. Absolutely. Um, but it's this one-on-one -on -one connection here. Right. You know, and I think in the, the human connection in general, you know, that's what we're losing sight of each day being mm -hmm. consumed by, you know, certain technologies and stuff like that. That's a whole other rabbit hole I won't go into. But, yeah. But the, the whole fact that we can sit here and talk and share our experiences and our, the most important, our failures. Right. To help others learn from that. As a society, I think we grow. Just imagine, imagine building, and, and I try to do this, imagine building this business without any of the connections that you've made along the way, without ever meeting Nick or Brandon from Bootstrap, without understanding the difference between like their trades. And I'm not being paid to say this by Bootstrap, by the way, but not understanding the difference between their trades and, and other trades. Um, not listening in on that product conversation last night the value that you get off of these connections is so hard to quantify. And I think everybody thinks, well, I can learn all this stuff online. I'll just watch YouTube. Mm. You know, there's so many do it yourself YouTube. Yeah, you're right. It's called do it yourself. But do it yourself only takes you so far. You're not going to build a long term viable, both financially and personally, business by just doing it yourself. You need to be surrounded by a network of really talented people that care about you, care about your business, and wanna see you succeed. And then they're willing to tell you the hard things. Mm -hmm. um, and they're willing to share their knowledge with you to help you succeed. Um, you can learn a lot off the internet and you can get a lot of really good information off the internet. But there's certain bits and pieces that no YouTube video is ever going to tell you. And what they don't tell you is what we're talking about right now. They're not going to talk about how to handle the stress. They're not going to talk about how to have a, a, a balance in your life. Because that's not what excites people. Yeah. You know, this. sometimes it's only the best scenario. That's all you see is the pretty pictures. Yeah. Look yeah. what I did. Yeah. Look at my five most profitable microgreens. Right. <laughs> Okay. I think we're all guilty of that too. You know, it's what? just this day and age, transparency is important too. I think everybody needs yeah. to see, you know, the pitfalls that we, we, we fall into each time. You know, it's just being able to have someone extend their hand out to help you pull you up. Yeah. And I'm not saying in a financial state, but I mean, just emotional support, uh, help you say, Hey dude, you're losing too much weight, man. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Let's, let's reevaluate re what's going on. Yeah. It's unhealthy. There's never going to be balance. Right. I, and I mean, we see that in nature all the time. There's never really balance. There's always something that throws things off. Mm -hmm. But I think it's being able to ride the waves, you know, with the right e equipment in the sense of support. Well, and making an effort to try to create some balance, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. It, it's, it's very hard. And what is perfect balance? Uh, you know, I don't think that's something that we can really define. But at least making the effort to try to create some balance in your life and understand that well, we may feel that the businesses are everything to us. The businesses are a means to an end. They're not everything. Everything is your family. It's your mm -hmm. friends. It's the people around you. It's the connections you make. The business is a way to make those connections. It's a way to support your family. It's a way to have financial freedom. But that's not why you're doing it, right? You're doing it because you love the people around you. So you want to support them. And you want to be successful for them. You want people to look at you as a successful person, as somebody who contributed to your community. Yes. If you just go in and you just think that, ah, I'm just going to be successful for me because I'm going to prove something to myself. Okay. But what does that do for you in 10 years? You proved yourself that you could, you could do it, which it's great. It's great to have self-confidence and you should be, every day you should be proving something to yourself. But at the end of the day, I think people need to take a step back and realize what's, what are you really doing it for? And that's something that I struggled with for a very long time. I, the entrepreneurial dream, you know, financial freedom, doing what I want, set my own schedule. Okay. That's a good place to be. That's a good goal to have. But I think people get away from the why behind it. Why are we doing this? You know, what really brought us all into this industry that currently in society is seen as a low income industry? I couldn't disagree with that more. 
Um, this industry is the most important industry in the world. You stop agriculture, well, the doctor and the lawyer don't eat. Yeah, the doctor. So they don't matter anymore. They're losing weight too. Yeah, yeah. They don't matter because guess yeah. what? They can't grow their own food. Right. They don't know how. Um, and yet we as a society have continued to push down this industry as, uh, you know, I'm just a farmer. Hmm. Yeah. They're just the person that grows the stuff that sustains your life, not just a farmer. And I think we're really lost right now as a society in terms of where we put our value. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that everybody should go out there and, you know, spend all of their money on food. What I am saying is maybe we should look at the things that we do buy and really give some thought. Do you actually need that? Or what if I bought healthier food? How does my quality of life actually change? And a lot of people see some dramatic changes when they make changes in the quality of the food that they eat. It's regenerative food, man. Well, and also it's, you're not buying something that gives you momentary pleasure. Right. Food, you get momentary pleasure from eating high quality, really good food, but then you get long-term pleasure in just feeling better, better mood, better health. A tchotchke, a gadget doesn't do that for you. Our cell phones are, are designed to give us these dopamine hits mm -hmm. consistently. But yet, do they make us healthier? I think the verdict's still out on that. You know? Yeah. So, but we just don't, we don't value the food that we put in our bodies enough. And I think once we start doing that, I think, I, I hope we will change the perception of what farmers are and we'll start to get back to seeing that farmers are the most important profession. And we need to be attracting the best and the brightest into this profession. And we need to find ways to pay them like they're the best and the brightest. Um, and I think that if we, if the only way we can do that is if you go out and you raise a hundred million dollars to build a massive farm, if that's the only way you can hire the best and the brightest, I think we have a pretty broken system. Mm -hmm. And the fact that a lot of farmers right now are basically stuck in this cycle where they have so much invested in their farm and they're growing commodity crops and they're at such they're at the whim of the market they're at the whim of politics yeah. and they don't have a choice like i think everybody look why don't they just change well it's not that easy you know they 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 have a half a million dollars in debt they have to make these debt payments or they're threatened with losing their farm their entire livelihood, literally their life. And yet we're like, well, why don't you just grow another crop? Well, it's not that simple. Yeah, we as a society need to come in and say, how can we help you make that transition? Um, you, take, you take a thousand acre farm and you turn 10 acres of it into vegetable production like high volume, high quality vegetable production. But somebody needs to help them get there. Yep. And there's, we could take money from federal subsidies for things like cotton, corn, soybeans, and funnel it into vegetable production. And vegetable production by and large is more profitable. Mm -hmm. So why aren't we incentivizing these people to do this? And, and it's, there's obviously, there's really deep seated issues there. Uh, we don't need to get into those, but I think that we need to put a little bit more value on how do we make sure that the farmers not only are taken care of in this country, but they're valued at a completely different level than what they're valued at now, which will incentivize more people that are working nine to five in consulting gigs and jobs they hate to get into this field without looking at it as, I don't want to be a farmer. Right. You know, <laughs> I come from the tech world. When I told people I was going to start a farm, everybody was this guy's crazy. Yo, I hear what is talk. wrong with yeah. him? You know? And so I think we just need to change the, change the narrative a little bit about who are farmers? What do they actually do for us? And what is their, what is their true level of importance in society today? That's going to take a long time to do. But I think that groups like this, networks like this can help move that needle forward. Um, but we also have to get out of the mindset that farming is, you need to put in 90 hours a week and you're not going to make a lot of money. Well, why? Mindset. 
That's yeah. Why would you accept that? Why don't you want to work 60 hours a week and make a lot of money and have a great work-life balance, be able to take your family on a vacation, be able to leave the farm for two weeks and the farm, because you have an amazing team, can take care of itself. Oh, and by the way, your team makes enough money to where they can take their family on a vacation for a week. Why don't we have that in farming? And so I think that that's, that's a really deep question that we need to start answering as a society. Because um, if you lose the farmers, you're stuck. And then, you know, I think it really, it, it boils down to, with all this information that's going out these days through all these different platforms, you know, we need to just speak out more. I think more conversations like this yeah. is going to help people, you know, see the importance of it. I mean, because the proof of concept is there. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, you know, you're watching all these smaller farms, you know, being successful. Though sometimes, though, they have issues with, you know, maybe marketing themselves properly to, right. to sell the product. So I think there's just an educational uh, bubble that needs to, you know, just be popped and let that information flow to everybody. Absolutely. And I think that's what we're doing with these groups and these larger farmers. There's nothing against them. You know, they have their systems. Like you said, there's millions of dollars invested into equipment, you know, and mm -hmm. the too big to fail concept, you know, is you can't, that doesn't, that doesn't apply. It doesn't apply because no. we let farms fail all the time. I know. I mean, so like, we need to actually help them, educate them and say, listen, you know, try it on a small piece of land. Like you said, you know, take that as your proof of concept. Right. But then not only just leave them there to do that. Sure. They're great growers, but. How can we teach them a different way of marketing the product and selling it to others and yeah. getting it in the right hands for people to be healthier? Well, and building networks too. Like yeah. what if what if you know you have a network of you go to the you know the Midwest and you just have thousands and thousands of acres of corn and soybeans? Well, what if those same farmers were to take two percent of each of their land and they all started growing high quality vegetables. Now it takes a long, now that soil's dead. So it takes a long time to get that soil back to health. Mm -hmm. But what if we had, I don't know, government grants, or we took some of the subsidies from those crops that don't actually sustain us in a healthy way and put those towards yes. helping some of these farmers make these transitions. And then those farmers have a consortium of people. They're all growing high quality vegetables they use they use their network to then be able to distribute these to the big buyers, the big grocery stores. And now instead of seeing a pepper that's grown in Chile, there's a pepper that's grown in Iowa. Who wouldn't want that? I mean, honestly, who would not want that? And we have the technology today to be able to do that. But I don't think right now we have the political will um, but that political will only comes by people actually starting to realize what the, where the problems come from. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I have all the answers, but at the same time, why aren't we looking at these kinds of things? If, if these farmers are being so pressured to keep their farms afloat and they're dealing with forces that are completely out of, outside of their control. Why aren't we as a society doing more to help them through that? And you can say, oh, well, what about the bailout money for the farmers because of the tariffs and all that? There's still farms closing every day. There's mm -hmm. still an incredibly high suicide rate among farmers. That's not helping. We need to be looking at complete transition for these farmers, but start small. Do these proof of concepts to see how it works. Build a small network of these farmers. And then all of a sudden, like everyone will say, well, we don't have the, the labor is too expensive. Well, at some point, the labor is going to get more expensive in Chile because that economy is going to continue to develop and those people are going to make more money. And then you have the shipping costs. Yeah. And so while we have free trade agreements, that shipping cost is still there. That's not free. It's never free. Well, and so not only the cost on the environment too. The cost on the environment, you but know, but we don't put a price term. on that. No, no, yet. <laughs> right. Eventually, we will. Right. Um, but why not try this out? Why not try to incentivize farmers to grow crops that we know we need to be eating to make our society more healthy? We know it. This isn't. There's no. It's not up for debate anymore. You can talk about all the different kinds of diets, 
it's not up for debate that you're going to be healthier if you eat more fruits and vegetables than eating processed foods. There's no debate there whatsoever. But how do we get it to a point where we can have farmers that can make really good livings by growing food that makes our society healthier as opposed to being incentivized to grow food that the vast majority of it just goes to feed animals so we just eat more meat. Well, eating more meat is not the solution to making our society healthier. It's also, you can talk about the environmental cost of it. Mm -hmm. But we all can recognize the importance of saving a farmer and saving a five, six generation old farm from going belly up and then being sold for pennies on the dollar. So you've just destroyed a livelihood. You've destroyed the towns that these people live in. And ultimately the only people that benefit are the, the mega farms that are able to come in and scoop this land up for pennies on the dollar. Nobody else benefits. The bank doesn't get their money because the farmer can't pay for it. Yeah. The community suffers. So we need to start thinking of different ways to change this. And I think you start out on a small scale. Um, help these farmers get to a point. And whether they're using controlled environment, agriculture, greenhouses, hoop houses, whatever it is, find ways to incentivize them to make small changes. Yeah. And like I, have groups too where they can actually learn and re-educate. Because, you know, like it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, they say. Yeah. But I mean, if you if you give them the visual aspect and have somebody coming in and actually taking that one-on-one -on -one and help. I think, you know, I think that might open up doors a little bit more yeah. than just trying to tell somebody, hey, you need to change what you're doing. Absolutely. Well, show me. Show me what I need to do, you know. Maybe not try to go take on more than you can chew and take on all these different crops, but maybe specialize on a few crops. Right. And get really good at it. Right. You know, just like these systems that, you know, when you're developing your system, you know, you started in a real small room mm -hmm. and then baby stepped it up till, well, you jumped up pretty quick, but, yeah. you know, <laughs> but, you know, and that, but it'd be better to little by little expand yeah. know, to what you're capable of Well, doing. we didn't build out all the, all the systems in a new farm right away. Okay. We started out one rack, two rack, three rack rack, four rack until we brought more and more racks online until we're up to 14. And, but we didn't do it all at once because you do it all at once. You don't get an opportunity to learn from the small scale. All of a sudden, all of these problems are happening all at once. And you also don't get the people trained to be able to handle that level of volume. And so things are going to fall apart and they're going to fall apart really fast. So when we're looking at scaling again, we have the same plan. You don't build out the entire farm all at once. We'll build out a third of the farm. Really get good at that. Figure out the tweaks we need to make. Figure out the design changes we need to make. Make those, get those systems humming along, and then you build out the next phase. Um, I think a lot of people, it's very easy to say, I'm selling out of all my products. I got to like quadruple in size. You can quadruple in size but you're not going to be quadrupling in production because you're just, you just don't have the capacity there yet. You don't have the team that's trained to get to that point. And I think a lot of people, they do too much too fast um, and they don't give themselves time to figure out the issues that they're going to inevitably come across. And so when we talk about, you know, proving out a model, proving out a concept, you have to take the time to slowly scale it. Don't do it all at once because ultimately you're setting yourself up for failure if you do that because you just don't have the level of knowledge. You don't have the time to be able to actually handle that much of an increase. Um, but you'll, you'll learn along the way. If you slowly incrementally increase, you learn to make your time more efficient to where you can manage 4x the volume in a very similar amount of time as you could where you start. And I think that a lot of people try to scale too fast and, and then they get caught. And it's like you see these farms where these people go from doing literally no growing, nothing, and they're sold on a model. 
by either a turnkey solution or somebody who's selling a certain type of system. And then these guys haven't grown 10 heads of lettuce. And then all of a sudden they're bringing on a big system all online at once and they're trying to grow 10,000 heads of lettuce. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. You know, and you have to give people an opportunity to learn as they go and then scale it. And unfortunately, the there's areas of the industry that will sell you these huge systems and they may give you a little bit of knowledge, but there's no replacing that on the job training that you just have to go through to figure out what works yeah. and what doesn't work. But these companies, you know, once they've sold the system and you got you all set up and running, they'll give you a little troubleshooting tips. But at the end of that, they got their money. They're they're walking away. Yeah, on to the next project. On to the next one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how do we as a community make sure that we're not setting people up for failure? That it it's all well and good to sell a really nice and expensive system, but if that system fails, what does that do for the industry? It it makes it too risky to get into scares investors away people that were really motivated had had all of the you know all of the goals were aligned and they had really good intentions but because we didn't as a community set them up for success they're out of the industry in in 12 months you know and i take i look at my son you know he's two and a half years old and and the same thing i'm looking at him like well, I need to make sure that I don't steer him the wrong way and just say, all right, well, good luck, buddy, you know, because yeah. that's not going to work. Right. So it, it, guide him. it's the same thing with any any type of business and, and, and anything you take on in life. You know, you have to guide them little by little, you know, sometimes pivot and go somewhere. Oh, oh let's not go that way. That car all of a sudden popped out of nowhere. Let's go this way instead, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think with, with business, the same thing um, in any industry. You know, I think we just need to sometimes just slow down. Take a look at the the big picture. Yeah. You know, don't be the ant that's crawling around in the grass. Climb up, look at it from a bird's eye view, see what that looks like, and, right. and realize where you know what you need to improve on. But exactly. Um, well, I really appreciate this conversation sure. because it's very eye opening, and I think more people need to hear this. You know, instead of like just jumping in, you know, blindly, it, right. it's, it's best to come into this, you know, little at a time and adjust as you grow. Absolutely. And, and thank you for having me on. You know, I'm always grateful to, to kind of have these connections and have these conversations because they're, they always make you think about things in a little bit of a different light. So absolutely. I feel like we're continuing this conversation too. 100%. You know, a lot of the information that you were coming out with was like, yes, more people need to hear this. <laughs> this is super important, you know? And I think it's by doing things like this that we're going to help others to hopefully open their eyes, you know? And I know we talked about at one point, you know, uh, with Wyeth about, you know, you need the hundred people to actually, the, the right hundred people to hear you to make it, make a difference and take what you're doing and, and help, you know, the overall community. Um, but sometimes, hey, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's their grandkids that are listening to something like this and then that information gets passed on. So uh, I think we shouldn't look so narrow as much as, you know, hey, let's talk to everybody. Let's just talk to everybody yeah. and let everybody as a whole make us stronger so that we can preach this, this word. I hate to word, use the word preach, but, but you know what I mean. Just to get uh, Yeah. The, at the, the end of the day, you're, you're, you're evangelizing um, ways to think about things. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, sometimes that word, that word works. Well, Ryan, um, so there's so much information that you, you offer and mm -hmm. so much value. Where can they learn more about you know, your farm? Um, I mean, you can go to our website. Our website right now basically just tells about us, freshimpactfarms.com. Um, I'm not very good on like like tweeting on social media or anything like that. I'm trying to get better at that kind of stuff. Huh? You're not a twit? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but follow us on Instagram. Um, and then, you know, we we do a lot of this stuff with, with Bootstrap. Um, and so... I'm sure there will be future conversations, uh, but yeah, you can follow us on on Facebook and Instagram, um, and then you know I'm sure you'll be hearing more from us over over the next 12 months for sure. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you, brother. I appreciate awesome. it. Thank you for the time. I love, I love sitting here and talking to you more. And guys, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Like I said, I, I'm a new uh, I'm new to the podcasting world, and so I, like I said, I don't know how long this guest hosting is going to go on for, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here and talk to special people like Ryan. So, guys, um, wherever you listen to your podcast, don't forget to subscribe to um, Bootstrap Farmer Radio. 
and just shoot a comment, you know, let us know or review, say what you think, say, hey, Oscar needs to slow down, maybe he's talking too fast or, no, I'm just kidding. But whatever you guys want to say, feel free to let us know. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And thank you. Don't forget, come back. We want to hear, we want to hear you guys as a community grow together with us. So. Thank well, you I think much. you're doing a great job as, as a guest host, by the way. So I'll put that, oh. I'll put that on the record. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Because, <laughs> you know, it. it's like anything. Well, let me, one last tidbit. So if you have a farmer friend out there or even yourself, you know, don't forget to your friends that are farming. Just just let them know what, you know, they're doing a great job, you know, and be there for them. I think mm-hmm. that's the most important part. And just that support, that moral support and say, hey, listen, I see what you're doing, man. And I appreciate what you're doing. I think is the most important thing that any farmer or any individual can have. And uh, let's just be there for one another. You know, we're a community and we should continue to grow this community uh, through love. And also a lot of hard work is going to be there. But, you know, hey, just that support. Pat on the back. High five right here. Right. There we go. All right, guys. So we're out of here. Thank you very much again. Take care. Hey everybody, this is Nick and I just want to send a quick shout out to Oscar for hosting these podcast sessions here lately. It's been really nice to have somebody cover that while we're deep in season at Bootstrap Farmer. And I wanted to let you know that as Oscar was filming this series from the 2020 Dallas Urban Farm Academy Mastermind, there was a whole nother series of recordings done in a group setting downstairs that you can find on the Urban Farm Academy podcast. And we would love to see you over on that side as well. So with that, check out what we have going on over there. Thank you for an amazing season so far into the 2020 growing season. And hey, we're uh, we're here if you need us. This podcast was brought to you by Bootstrap Farmer. Music by Random Rab. Thank you for your work, and we'll see you next week.